everyone. Thank you for attending our Raman Microscopy and Imaging webinar today. Our presenter is Dr. Carlos Marillo, who received his postdoc at the Advanced Industrial Science and Technology in Fukuoka and was research scientist at Kyushu University in Japan, where he lived for several years. Carlos received his Doctorate of Engineering from Kyushu University and his Master's in BS from Simon Bolivar University in Caracas, Venezuela. And he is an application scientist here at JASCO Inc. So we're going to get started. Um, and Carlos, if you want to begin, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Leah, for your introduction. Uh, well, today I'm going to be talking about Raman microscopy and imaging. Uh, first, I just a uh, few words about uh, JASCO. JASCO is the Japanese spectroscopy company, uh, also known in Japan as Nihon Bunko. Uh, the R&D and manufacturing uh, facilities are in Hachioji, Japan. And their founders are uh, the physicist Yoshio Fujioka and Shinichiro Tomonaga, who shared the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1975 with Dr. Richard Feynman in quantum electrodynamics. Uh, JASCO was established in the United States in 1972 and we are located in Eastern uh, Maryland. This is uh, like a suite of our spectroscopy and chromatography uh, products. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about Raman microscopy and imaging. I just want to remind you that uh, maybe three or four weeks ago, uh, Dr. Burgess, James Burgess also made a presentation about the principles of Raman uh, fundamentals, so I strongly recommend that you watch also that webinar. Uh, with that, I just want to go over the presentation overview. I'm going to look in again at the Raman spectrometer uh, schematic, uh, talking why someone is interested in micro Raman also some of the JASCO Raman products. And I divided these, the way that I thought that imaging in spectroscopy imaging should be divided is in two parts. One is the observation mode uh, that facilitate to take an image and also the scanning or mapping to create a Raman mapping images. So I'm going to uh, be talking about two different scanning modes in the JASCO products. One is the fast mapping that we call the QRI, that is the Q quick Raman imaging. Also the surface scanning image that is the SSI, and that is recommended for tilted, uneven, or rough uh, surfaces. I'm going to be looking at different features that help to take images and expedite the process of uh, making uh, Raman images. And later I'm going to be looking at different applications uh, of uh, Raman imaging. So this is uh, the schematic of uh, Raman spectrometer. And uh, this was explained in the basics of uh, Raman, but today I just want to emphasized in three different parts. Uh, I'm going to be looking at the objective lens, sample stage, and the detector. Just to review, uh, the light source in a Raman spectrometer is the laser. The, and the laser goes to a beam splitter. And in here, the light is going to be reflected, then go to the objective lens. It is uh, reflected and it's going to create the Raman signal. And this Raman signal is going back. And this time it's not reflected, it's not transmitted through the beam splitter. Go to a mirror, then reject some filter, split. The light then is dispersed in a grating, and then it goes to the detector. So why micro Raman? Why somebody would like to look at the micro Raman? Uh, well, the Raman uh, is um, a micro technique. So this means that 
actually where the laser is focused, in that same spot, the light is going to be scattered. And that is what we want to actually measure. The Raman microscopes, uh, besides to have the spectrometer, the microscope is using the microscope optics. So that is going to define the sample, uh, and sampling area, also the special resolution for the measurement and the imaging. And of course, because it's a micro, micro sample, it's going to require less sample. And at the same time, it's going to produce less uh, fluorescence. And the Raman microscope are a confocal microscope. And in this feature, and I'm going to be showing this in the application, the measurement can be taken under the surface. That means that we can create, we can take measurements inside the sample. Also, we can take measurements and create images in 3D. Some of the applications for uh, the random spectrometer, one is the semiconductor. Uh, we can measure stress and impurities in a semiconductor, which is really important. Uh, semiconductor devices should be stress-free and is, they shouldn't have any impurity that reduce the conductivity in the device. Also, the polymer is a very common uh, application, similar to IR. A polymer materials are going to uh, are very sensitive to the any shift in the vibration due to the laser light, and they are very. Uh, it's a very common application another very common application the carbon material they have a very nice raman signal so as a consequence it's very easy to measure diamond graphite graphene diamond like carbon in uh raman spectrometers pharmaceutical applications one of the most popular application is the imaging of the medical ingredients especially looking at the distribution of the ingredient all over the surface of more specific to a tablet uh, with a more like an, a quality control uh, goal. And of course, we can look at the different, uh, we can call it crystallinity of the active ingredients. Some active ingredients are crystal, some of them are morphous. So that's why we include the, the crystal polymorphism. And geology is a very common uh, technique, and this is one of the advantages of the laser uh, Raman uh, spectroscopy. It is possible to measure the crystal structure and also uh, look into any gas that is included in the mineral. Some of the products and solutions that GASCO provides is the RMP500, that is our portable Raman and actually is a Raman Pro. We have our standard model, that is the NRS4500. High end models is the NRS5500, uh, 5600, and the flagships is the our series of 7000. Uh, our standard model is the 4500. Most of application can be done in this instrument, but when somebody really needs a very specific application, it can go to 5,000 or 7,000 series. These three models uh, in, uh, can have the accessory for the QRI that it has speed imaging system. And this is the focal length, and this is the main difference between this system, uh, the focal length, Again, I recommend that you go back and look at the Raman uh, Fundamentals uh, webinar. It's going to uh, provide the resolution, a spectral resolution of the instrument. Uh, these two instruments, uh, the 500 and the 4500, ha can have only one detector and is basically the CCD or the EMCCD. I'm going to be talking in a few slides about that. Uh, it, they are more for a quality control environment and academia, and it has several applications like microplastic multilayer materials, like polymer multilayer material, carbon materials, impurity, biological samples. Uh, in the case of the 
5,000 and 7,000 series, we can add two detectors, either the CCD, EMCCD, or an in-gas detector. And the in-gas detector is more for the near IR uh, lasers, like uh, the 785 and the 1064. And these um, instruments, especially the 7000, is more for high spectrum resolution application and uh, very low wave number measurement. We can go up to 10 or 5 wave number with these uh, two instruments. And for the high uh, wave number resolution um, applications, you can find that with the stress in semiconductor, also impurities. And I'm going to show some of those examples at almost at the end of the webinar. So, how uh, uh, what is required to create a high definition Raman image? First, you can have uh, different modes. Also, it is required a high pixel camera. Uh, other stage that can move in X and Y and also in the Z direction. Uh, there are more popular these um, applications nowadays uh, where a um, large or wide uh, map area is required so you someone can need a fast uh, function and also for surfaces that they are uneven uh, or rough surfaces, we can have, and this is a, a product from JASCO, the surface scanning imaging. Uh, of course, after the collection of all this data, it is required to create images, the analysis, and the, the process of the data. Okay, so some of the observation modes. Uh, this is uh, the bright field. The bright field is the most common uh, microscopy technique to take images. The light comes from above of the objective lens or from below. And the main characteristic is that you are going to see a gray uh, area with some contrast or gray, more gray or darker uh, faces. The other uh, Observation mode is the dark field. In the dark field, the light doesn't come from above or under. It just comes from one of, it comes oblique. And what we are going to look is the dispersion of the light. And actually, it can reproduce the color of the sample very, very, very well. The only issue here is that some of the dark uh, uh, samples or the dark faces are going to be missed. So we have a mixed uh, observation mode where the bright and dark field are combined. So everything, it can be observed. Now the dark areas here, it can be observed. Also the color ones. And actually in this mode, then we can go exactly, since we have an auto stage, we can go exactly where the point we want to make the measurement. And actually, you can see here the Raman spectrum of this yellow particle, or the red, the magenta one, or black. Those are the measurements that we were making in with different uh, laser lines. Only another observation mode is the polarization. In here, the light it gets polarized, and of course, if, if the sample can be polarized, we are going to observe different faces. In the case of this sample, this is just a slight rock sample that is a very common application for geological uh, samples, is the polarized uh, mode. And of course, in the in the image, we cannot see any different faces, but actually when we apply the polarization in 90 degrees, we can see that a different face can appear and then make the measurement in those different areas. The last uh, 
observation mode that I want to show is the, the differential inter interference contrast, or very well known as an DIC. And in this uh, observation mode, what it really is important is it is we are able to see features that they don't appear when the bright light is used. I was, uh, uh, before joining JASCO, I was working in, with failure analysis and these uh, observation modes was very efficient when I was trying, for example, loop contamination in printed circuit boards that sometimes I look at in the bright uh, field and I couldn't find any, uh, sign of contamination, then I was using dark field and um, there was no any feature highlighted, but when we use the DIC mode is the moment that I could find some of the features that I was interested, actually contamination. Okay, so the other part that I think is important in, in spectroscopy imaging is the creation of maps. And these maps are created based on a specific uh, vibrational band. With these, uh, usually the procedure or the methodology that we use is just take an image in the bright field. Then what we do is create an array uh, with different uh, points and the Raman spectrum is going to be collected at each uh, circle. Uh, the sample that you are looking here is uh, microspheres of uh, polymers. And here there are two different polymers. Then when we did, uh, when we took the from spectra, we find out that the two polymers are PMMA and polystyrene. And then the Raman image is created based on the specific uh, vibration band of the spectrum that we measure. This is uh, a, the typical procedure to create a Raman image, even uh, what we call the standard or slow speed. But I would like to show uh, the next uh, feature that we call QRI, that is the quick Raman imaging, and this is for high speed uh, mapping and imaging. In this case, uh, what we're looking here is just the objective length of the microscope. The Raman, the Raman, um, the laser comes through the objective and is going to take the measurement in the sample. Uh, you can see the grid here that is created, similar to what I showed before. And actually, in this method, the stage uh, is moving. So uh, this is the configuration for a QRI system. Of course, we need the Raman spectrometer. We are going to have a high-speed uh, stage that is... Um, also automated, it can move in X, Y, and Z. And additionally to that, we are going to use the uh, detector that is an EMPCD and the exposure is recommended to be less than 50 uh, milliseconds. Additionally to these hardware uh, uh, accessories, we need to add other uh, software that is going to help us to create uh, the image. So the conventional, uh, I was talking before about the standard conventional imaging uh, versus the QRI. Uh, in this image, we can see uh, this sample is a graphene. On top, we can see the mapping using a conventional imaging. This is a Raman spectrum that looks very uh, noisy. Also, this is the bright field image, and we can see also the mapping uh, that is created uh, live. But with the QRI, we can see that also we have a very clean uh, Raman spectrum. The same uh, bright field uh, image 
but we can see that the, the map already has been created. It is much more faster, it's much more clear, and it's about 50 times faster than the conventional mapping. So for a, the standard um, detector that is used in the Raman spectrometer is the CCD, but in the case of the path mapping, we need an EMCCD uh, detector. Actually, the detector, the CCD detector can run in different modes. One is the EM, that is what we call the electron multiplier. And actually, what it's doing is just applying a higher voltage. And then when the signal is registered, those electrons that they are actually mesh being measured in the CCD detector, they are increased. As a consequence, what we have is just an electro multiply signal. It's a signal that is going to increase the intensity of those peaks of interest. So this is a, the graphene uh, sample. Um, the spectrum on top is showing the D band and D band. Also, we have the peaks uh, down uh, in the spectrum, in the Raman spectrum below. Also, we have G band, D band, but we can see that the image is much more clear and is more, much more sharp than the image uh, above. So, what is really happening is that, for example, when we have a measuring interval that is similar to the beam spot of the Raman, and this measurement interval is something like one micron in the step. And when I say step, is the step that the stage is moving. The image looks really uh, pixel. But if the measuring interval is much more smaller than the spot size of the laser, what we end up doing is collecting a lot of sample and actually what we are doing is just overlapping uh, the measurement. This, uh, like, as you can read here, it's a 0.1 micron step. It's something like 100 nanometers, uh, and is the resolution of this uh, fast, uh, high-speed stage. Additionally to that, after we do the measurement, we have a digital filter uh, process, and what the digital filter process is doing is just reducing the signal uh, to noise. So uh, this, is, this measurement is done using only the CCD with the standard detector. If it goes really fast, we are not going to be able to register the signal. And actually, when a QRI plus an EM, uh, EMCCD is used, we can see how the uh, images start to be uh, developed. But as actually after when we use the digital filter the image comes much more uh, sharp and actually what it's just doing is uh, creating or enhancing this image based on the information of the image of each spectra, spectral band actually what it's just doing is collecting enough information to uh, make these maps with a better edge, reduce the signal, uh, reduce the noise, increase the signal to noise. That is actually what we are doing this step. So this is just an example when the filter is used. We can see that uh, just um, I'm, I'm showing what I, I was explaining before. We have uh, the signal and then the digital filter is applied. We have a better spectrum. As a consequence, we can have a better image. And this is what we actually, we want to, uh, that is the final goal, to be able to reproduce and ram an image. And the only way to do it is with a very clean spectrum. But if we need to map a large area very fast, we have some challenges, and those challenges are overcome using detectors like the EMCCD and also a hat speed stage and some 
uh, software data processing as a digital filter. Additional to the dig digital filter, we use the spectral averaging, and this is something that we can uh, able enable, and it's just to improve the, uh, to smooth the data and to have a better uh, signal. In these uh, samples, we have again our PMMA uh, microspheres. The measurement was already done used without the EMCCD. We have our PIG, then the digital filter is applied, the image is improved, and after that, we can do an average of spectrum. And the average is just the average of uh, the spectrum is not working in any fashion with the image. Uh, with this, we smooth the data, the data improve, and we can get, as a result, we have even better pictures. And this is another example of, of graphing. We have the D prime band, the G band, D band. Uh, these are specific uh, bands for graphing. Um, for those that work with graphing, this is very familiar, but I just want to show this example because we are able to show the bright field image and, and simultaneously, and at the same time that we are running the test, the image can be created for different bands, and then you can have a map of, of the whole sample uh, after you finish your measurement. So actually what we do and the flow chart that in JASTO we use and maybe is, is what we are doing and it can be follow. Uh, it's just, we are just taking the measurement, uh, the high speed, we have our spectrum, then those spectrum can be uh, improved using digital filtration, reducing noise or doing uh, spectrum averaging and also we can reduce or correct the fluorescence and additionally to that we can use different chemometric techniques like MCR that is the multivariate curve resolution. Uh, also you can use PCA that is the principal component analysis and spectral correlation. All these techniques are very well known, very well established. I'm mentioning today, but this topic of creating a images using uh, chemometric technique is is very, very. Uh, I think it would take me a long time to make an uh, explanation of this, and I think, and I was, uh, I think the best is to have a webinar dedicated only to chemometric. So please, uh, I'm going to save that for that moment. But actually, uh, something that I really like to use MCR for those that they are familiar with chemometric is that MCR is one of those techniques that doesn't need any uh, input. When I say input is just we have to know what are the concentration of the ingredient. So instead of that, uh, the MCR is able to create these maps only with the information after the measurement. And this is something that we can do and is automatically done. The PCA is a technique that is used mainly for clustering and grouping. And also you can do, you can use it for, to create these images at the same as the spectral correlation. But in, in my opinion, the, the technique that is uh, very efficient, is easier, and is for novice uh, users, MCR is one of those that needs to go. Okay, so we look at the path mapping for wide areas. Now we are going to uh, switch gears to the surface scanning image. And this is more uh, applicable to uh, tilted or uneven or rough surfaces. So actually what we are doing in this uh, application with this application 
it's just uh, changing the height of the stage while the measurement is done. But the way that we do it is we are going to make a register what is the topography of the sample, and after that, the measurement is done. And actually, this is the methodology of the SSI. What it's doing is the data is collected in this red spot. The random signal is collected there. Then the stage is going to lower. It's going to take it in the, in the next uh, measurement spot. Then it's going to raise it, and it's going to take it in the next one. But the way that it, that is done is uh, with a feature that we call all in focus. And actually, what we are doing is just uh, stitching all the images. And the stage is going from zero microns. In this example, it goes from zero microns to 250 microns. And actually, what the stage is doing is moving. And when the sample is focused, it's going to take an image there. And it's going to move to the next uh, place. Uh, and when the sample is focused, it's going to take an image to finally stitch all the image and we can see uh, a 2D image or we can create a 3D. So when we take the random spectrum of the images of a uh, surface that it has uh, these topography, you can see that uh, if the stage doesn't lower, we can see that the here is focus. It can take a very well and very well defined uh, image in this uh, area. In this in, in this area, because it's not focused, it's going to be blur, and then at the end, it's not going to be perfectly focused. But in the case of SSI, what it's doing is just taking the spectrum. The stage is going to lower, and you can see the difference is all in focus is all uh, optimized to get a good spectrum as a consequence is going to have a, a good image. So the two scanning modes, before I show the observation modes, you can take images and you can take uh, points of uh, sample, a specific point, and take the Raman spectrum there with the scanning mode. You can have a, a grid and collect the uh, spectrum of each grid. We have the option to do it in a fan in a fast fashion that is called QRI. We can do it slower if the surface it have certain topography, and all is going to at the end have a very nice uh, image. Some of, some of the JASTA imaging features, these are just features that I, I was putting together this webinar and I thought that this is very helpful. Uh, we have what we call the focus nav that is just the out of focus. And if the sample is placed in the instrument, the first uh, objective lens that we are going to find is the 5x. And this is, we can think about it of a rough uh, focus or a rough autofocus uh, just to start our measurement. The next uh, feature is called ViewNav, and this is just going to help with the auto alignment, uh, the auto light adjustment. And especially, it's very effective when we go from 20 to 100x. Uh, when we switch, everything is going to be optimized, the gain of the camera, the light. And for those samples that they are really difficult to find, those two features that I show, autofocus and then the auto line adjustment, is, is very helpful to find those very challenging samples of sometimes uh, powder or particles. The sample search, uh, search function is other features that we have and I really like this feature especially for samples that they are like dust 
uh, microparticles, microplastics, the software automatically is going to identify whatever you whatever is recognized as a possible sample. The samples can be rectangular or circular. They are going to recognize, then they are going to register. And in this registration, you can uh, the user can decide whether or not take the measurement. And finally, something that is really useful, if you if the user upload uh, uh, a database by itself or using JASCO or Raman uh, database, the software is going to automatically identify the particles. And we can do this uh, simultaneously exactly when when you are measuring the uh, doing the measurement of these particles some of the particles uh, parameters that uh, we use is the search uh, nav uh, and in these particle parameters there are different uh, parameters that can be refined like the size circularity the color it comes from RGB or the brightness the contrast for those that it, uh, have worked with particle, uh, if you don't assume the particle is uh, it have a circular shape and you have an oblong shape, uh, you can use two different uh, diameters. One is the ferret. You can measure in vertical or horizontal. For these applications, for these uh, parameters, we can have up to, I'm just showing like five here, but it can go up to 16 different uh, parameters. Of course, you can select which samples to measure. Here are the small uh, fish and the small particles. Also, you can decide only to measure the large uh, uh, particle. Uh, the IQ frame of uh, location of the measurement uh, is just that in this accessory, we use a sample holder with a relative coordinate. And these coordinates, uh, what we have here is just the uh, sample. When with these relative coordinates are safe in the file where the measurement is done. And actually it can be used to uh, measure the same position in a Raman instrument, also in a FDR microscope. And we can measure the same location either in the same Raman instrument or go to the uh, other instrument. And we have the possibility to measure the same sample at the same location in a micrometer size at different times. Uh, this is an example of the combined uh, measurement of IR and Raman. Um, in this sample, we can see that we have some uh, polymers, also some proteins, and the carbon is detected when the Raman is uh, used. So finally, uh, some of Raman imaging uh, applications. Uh, we have uh, this wide area imaging for a pharmaceutical tablet. Uh, this tablet measure uh, 10 millimeters in diameter. And actually, uh, it was done using the QLI, that is the fast uh, mapping. All these uh, measurements was done using something like 32,000 different points. And of course, the EMCT detector, it was, using, it was used to collect uh, the data. Also, the, here are the components of this uh, tablet. And it was used MCR uh, to create the, uh, this uh, map. Again, uh, QRI is used uh, because it can increase the speed of the testing. And this measurement, it was collected in something like a 50 minute. The same measurement can be taken in uh, several hours if it's only run in a standard uh, mapping mode. The other application, as I mentioned before, is the carbon material. So 
in this case graphene. Uh, here are Raman spectra of different Raman uh, of different carbon materials, and these uh, materials can be either measure or uh, image using uh, Raman. This technique in this uh, application, we can see the a silicon carbide uh, wafer that is getting more and more popularity. And in this application, what we did is just to measure uh, one uh, contamination or one precipitate. And it's really interesting how in the Raman, and this is specifically for applications with high, resolu high spectral resolution, we can see that the uh, Raman spectrum is very similar, they are very close, but when you really have a very high resolution instrument is when you can see the difference between the two spectrum and actually determine that that uh, precipitate that you see there is just a defect in the uh, silicon wafer. The other application is for the stress evaluation using Raman and actually uh, using the Raman and using like the calibration in this case of silicon, we know that any change to the right or the left, it can represent a compressive stress or a tensile uh, stress if the variation goes from even, we are talking about uh, one wave number, it goes from minus 0.2 to plus 0 0.2 wave number. And actually, we can see how the, all the compressive stress, it can be either measured or mapped, and the whole uh, compressive stress is present in the, in the corner. Uh, for biological samples, uh, we have here a coral uh, crystal polyform distribution. We have uh, the coral crystal, and it has two uh, representation of the coral, one is aragonite and the other is calcite, but it's really interesting that uh, both Raman uh, spectra, they look very similar, but when we go to the low wave number, even close to 50 or 200, we can see that they are uh, different. In the Another application is the sample uh, hidden uh, imaging analysis. We can, in this case, the sample that we're using is a laminated ceramic uh, capacitor. These ceramic capacitors have uh, different layers, and one is a perovskite, and the other is nickel. So when the temperature is increased, what is really interesting is that the crystalline structure is changing. And of course, this it goes uh, it will produce a failure in this type of ceramic capacitor. So what it was done is to increase the the temperature, make the Raman uh, measurement, and actually the technique of PCF, the principal component analysis, was used to classify the data and actually find out how to create groups of these points and we found and it was found that the actually at different temperature there was a discrete difference between the uh, crystalline structure uh, the last uh, application that I have is the 3d imaging and this is an example of uh, embedded materials in a uh, polymer. In this case, we have uh, titanium dioxide with the unattached phase and silicon. Uh, this is the spectrum that was taken, but actually we ha can have either a 3D image with the location of the particles, or we can create a 3D image slice of the uh, sample. With this, I just want to finish um, reinforcing the idea of uh, analyzing and processing the data after the measurement. And one of the technique is the MCR, as I mentioned before. And in this uh, measurement, 
what it was just taken it, it these uh the measurement was done as i was mentioning before creating a grid and after that grid was created nothing was needed to first uh determine that there are three different components and those three different components can be uh mapped in the image so and i think like again this is a technique that i need to i'm going back to explain this but in a maybe a fully dedicated uh webinar okay i think with this i just want to thank everybody i just want to invite you again to follow our educational resources. We have more upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, one is for our first SST uh, theory and application uh, webinar. This is uh, for our chromatography uh, instruments. After that, we have an FDIR and microscopy uh, webinar. Please visit our website. We have ebooks or tip and tricks poster. If you want uh, your poster, you just can email uh, us. We can email you the poster or we can send you a printed poster. You can check the knowledge base to uh, see all the articles that uh, are using uh, JASCO instruments. And uh, please check in ResearchGate that we have a uh, circular dichroism spectroscopy uh, ebook there that you can freely download. Uh, next webinar is uh, next week, as I say, is in SFC theory and application with Mr. DJ Tangarelli, that is our application uh, scientist for chromatography. Okay, with this, I just want to finish. I just want to remind you that uh, everybody's going to receive a uh, copy of the slides, also a link with the recording, and also now we are open for questions. Yeah, we have a question like, what is the bottom line of the QRI mapping? How important is the stage, is the stage in the QRI? How much time takes uh, to map 100,000 points area? So the bottom line of doing the QRI is uh, to create an image of, uh, especially for a wide area like the tablet that I show, and if you're interested to look what is the distribution of the active ingredients of uh, pharmaceutical tablets, that is uh, really important for uh, at least the application that I have worked. It's very important for the pharmaceutical companies because uh, you want to check if there is any agglomeration of the active ingredient or if you want to see where the amorphous of the crystalline ingredient is uh, dispersed in the in the surface of the tablet and see if this if it's homogeneous also uh, how important is the state in the QRI is very important it needs to be a manual a, a automated stage also needs to have a small step, like 100, nano, 100 nanometers. And uh, how much takes to it takes to 100,000 points? The to take it depends on the time that you are uh, using to collect. But for example, for a that tablet that I showed there, that it, it is like 32,000 points, and the collection time of each point was 20 milliseconds. It takes something for 32,000 points, it takes something like 16 minutes or 15 minutes. Okay. There is some question what are the laser wavelength op options? Uh, we have a, a several. A wavelength uh, option. The standard that we use is 532. Also, very easy to put the 785, 457. Uh, also, we have 405. We can go to the UV 
also go to the uh, near IR 785-1064. So uh, if you check the the previous uh, webinar, you are going to find that there are several uh, uh, lines. How do you deal with uh, fluorescence for carbon? I guess it's carbon and diamond uh, materials. Uh, we have we have different features to control the the fluorescence one we have uh, a patented uh, software that it, it will deal with the fluorescence also for the high end instrument we have a feature called double uh, special filtration that we put two slit uh, pinholes and that is going to reduce the uh, fluorescence a lot uh yeah so there are different ways to 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 do it how can ramen give more information than other techniques uh with graphene well that is a very good question uh i'm familiar with the measurement of graphene using the the ramen i i haven't studied graphene with other techniques Oh, what is the temperature for the heating uh, cooling state? Uh, we have different uh, models. This can go uh, to room temperature, below room temperature, up to 600 Celsius degree, and the, the high temperature could be 1500 uh, Celsius degree. Can JASCO system perform surface enhanced uh, Raman spectroscopy on biological samples? Yes, we can use uh, SIRS. And SIRS, what is really important is just the substrate that you're using. Actually, uh, the substrate that we use, and it's the substrate that mostly is, uh, we use substrates that they are commercially available, and actually they are using gold. Uh, gold nanoparticles, and that is what we use for uh, SIRS. It, it says, can a quantitative analysis be performed with this uh, technology, and can the distribution of API on a tablet be quantified? Uh, the first question is yes, because we have a suite of uh, kinometric uh, package, and then we can even, we have five different uh, algorithms to use to quantitate the, the components. Uh, we can use CLS, PCR, and ILS. And PCA, we use it mostly for uh, imaging and MCR for imaging. So yeah, definitely we can find what is the uh, quantitative the, the IPA and also we can look into the distribution of the of the tablet quantified. This is something that I was asked before. And yes, we can we can help you with that. Uh, what's the smallest spot size, step size, and a special resolution? The step size that we have is 100 nanometers with the, uh, with the other stage. Uh, special resolution is going to be determined on the laser that you're using uh, for either 532, 785, but you know that there are some, uh, um, restrictions, physical restrictions for that. And the smallest spot size, I think, if I remember well, we are talking about something about three micrometers or lower than that. Well, Leah, I think that are all the questions that I have in the panel. Yep, that's all the questions we've got coming in right now. Um, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to visit our website at jascoinc.com. 
Um, and as Carlos mentioned before, we'll be sending out the PowerPoint slides um, and a copy of the presentation as well. So thank you, Carlos. And thank you, everyone, thank for you, attending. Lee.